criticized by the Inspector General because 20% of its radiation monitors in the U.S. were out of service when Fukushima, when the Fukushima catastrophe began. And a very important point, and I want everyone to hear this, sampling a piece of food every once in a while gives you no real idea of the scope of the contamination or the bioaccumulation and doesn't pinpoint any radiation hotspots that might exist. So in general, testing of U.S. foodstuffs is inadequate. The U.S. limit of 1,200 becquerels per kilogram of just cesium-134 and or 137 is way too high. And it isn't binding because the FDA can decide to act or not at any level of cesium contamination. So it's exactly like not having a standard at all. Japan, on the other hand, their limit is 100 becquerels per kilogram. Finally, release of info to the public is paltry, if at all. So what have they found so far? <clears throat> California kelp, iodine levels were significantly higher than before Fukushima. They didn't test it for cesium, and they should. They've asked for funding. I don't know if they've got it. I don't know an update on this, but this is important because kelp provides a food source for fish. So there is concern that contamination from the fish that eat the kelp will be concentrated within the fish. Pistachios grown in California were shipped to a Japanese supermarket. The Japanese supermarket tested 18 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137. And then they shipped them off Japan, their shelf. Was tested and approved for market sale and then recalled, but not before it was fed to Japanese school children. All of this beef could have been sold to the U.S., and the FDA may not have pulled it. California grass, 14 becquerels per kilogram, cesium-134 and 137. Grass, like kelp, is the beginning of a potential biomagnification chain which could concentrate cesium in cattle, for instance. And as Berkeley put it on their monitoring site, for understanding the time dependence of food chain results, the grass and soil is what to look at. Green tea, 162 kilograms of it shipped to France from Japan and rejected because of this level of contamination, 1,038. The U.S. recommendations would have accepted this. Bluefin tuna swam all the way across the Pacific and reached the California coast, retaining cesium-134 and 137. Canada's cesium limit is apparently 1,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. And news reports expressed concern that they will import very contaminated fish from Japan. It is a concern that the U.S. should also share. They were also concerned because contamination was higher in 2012 than it had been in 2011. And this fits with cesium's tendency to biomagnify, but we will have to stay tuned and we should keep measuring ocean fish from the Pacific for cesium. Because of the tendency to biomagnify, in general, we need more testing. And we need to think about how to test over a longer time frame, not just a few years. So how should we think about these contamination levels, and how low should we attempt to make cesium contamination in our food? Remember two things. There's no safe level of radiation. Every exposure does carry some risk, no matter how small. And two, Cesium-134 and 137 did not exist in nature before we created and released them. This graph is from ICRP Report 111. ICRP stands for uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection. They recommend how much exposure is okay for humans. Governments follow these recommendations when setting standards. This graph shows us even what are considered very small amounts of cesium when ingested routinely can build up to unexpected levels in the body. <clears throat> so it specifically shows that after about three years, ingesting 10 becquerels per day of cesium-137 can cause a buildup to over 1,400 becquerels total cesium-137 in your body. For a child, who weighs about 30 kilograms, or about 66 pounds, this would be about 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137 in them. And this number is important because in studies of post-Chernobyl Belarus, cardiac abnormalities, heart problems, developed in children, who, children whose bodies contain 10 to 30 becquerels per kilogram of cesium. Irreversible myocardiopathologies develop at 50 
becquerels per kilogram. Additional pathologies at these low levels can include hormone imbalances, angina, diabetes, and hypertension, which, by the way, are all sort of aging diseases as well. In addition to these diseases, as cesium passes out of your body, its radioactivity starts to damage your kidneys and your bladder, which in turn damages your body's ability to rid itself of the cesium. This could mean that your body could collect cesium more quickly than this graph currently shows, which means the total amount of cesium in your body would be higher over time than this graph shows from chronic ingestion. Why is the US guideline so high? And how about Canada's? Well, it seems to be some sort of official policy to encourage people to accept increasingly radioactive food. Consider this quote also from ICRP report 111. There may be situations where a sustainable agricultural economy is not possible without placing contaminated food on the market. As such, foods will be subject to market forces. This will necessitate an effective communication strategy to overcome the negative reactions from consumers outside the contaminated areas. So their plan consists not of informing the public that these contamination levels, what the contamination levels are so that we can decide for ourselves what is and is not appropriate. It consists instead of convincing us that man-made radiation in small doses is not harmful. So what are we going to do about this? Well, <clears throat> beyond nuclear and coalition with other groups that are part of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, or FAN, are in the process of petitioning the Food and Drug Administration of the United States for a binding contamination, contamination limit of five, five becquerels per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137. We're also asking for testing of soils and other things. We are asking that the testing be widespread and that the data collected be recorded in a publicly available database, no matter what the cesium contamination level. A database of this information, if constructed properly, could inform research on cesium mobility, biomagnification in the environment, so it could have a broad usefulness, not just for consumers, but for research as well. If you want an easy to understand resource on this whole issue, Silence Deafening Fukushima Fallout A Mother's Response by Kimberly Roberson speaks to the urgent need for food monitoring as radiation from nuclear power is now migrating to our homes and kitchens. And of course, I'm with Beyond Nuclear. Uh, we have a newsletter. We're going to be having a public petition so that people can sign on this issue. We haven't got it up and running yet, but stick with our website, uh, info at beyondnuclear.org, and you can request our weekly newsletter. So, concluding remarks. When I first started to collect information that would help me recommend a level for cesium contamination in food, and five becquerels per kilogram was being bandied about, I wondered if this limit and the testing, that testing most of our food supply was somehow unreasonable. Through my research, I concluded no for several reasons. Cesium concentrates or biomagnifies in the environment through natural processes, so diluting it won't save us, ultimately. We have to track it and its movements. Historic and continuing cesium releases ensure that generations of humans have now been exposed to it. To what end? What is the damage that has already been done that we may not be able to see? And I'm thinking of multi-generational damage here. Belarus studies show damage at very low levels in children, and ICRP admits that even small amounts of cesium can bioaccumulate in our bodies to this level. There's a lack of publicly available info on cesium levels in food, and we have no reliable estimate on how much...